Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Modern and Modest with myself, Noshina Ghani, and a guest that we have seen on our show before, clinical psychologist Hamida Basa. Assalamu alaikum, Hamida, and welcome back to Modern and Modest. Wa alaikum assalam, Noshina. It's good to be back on the show. Alhamdulillah. So, Hamida, we know that October marks uh, Mental Health Awareness Month, and uh, maybe you can tell us more about why your mental health is so important. And tell us more about this awareness uh, that you know that's going on now in October. Yeah, okay. you can just give There's us more inf uh, information on that. So, uh, Jazakra so much, uh, Noshina. So, uh, mental health awareness is a very important topic for a lot of uh, mental health professionals like myself. And why we're always trying to strive for awareness and trying to get people to, to be more acknowledging that there are mental health issues and that people you know or yourself may be facing mental health difficulties. So one of the things that ha that the KZD Mental Health Advocacy Group does every year is that in October they do a walk at North Beach where everyone and anyone can come, the entry is free, you can get your mental health check done and you can have a fun after fun morning walking on the beach and just spending time with your family and just talking about mental health or asking people about what to do if you have mental health concerns. So we're always just trying to create awareness because the more awareness we have for mental health, the less stigma there is around it. Sure. Mm -hmm. Hamida, you mentioned where you can go and have your mental health uh, assessment or test done. Yes. What do they actually do uh, in order to assess you? What type of tests get done? Um, mental health professionals use a very use a range of questions, and we use a range of questions in our clinical interview that that determines whether or not a person is functioning well. So we have a lot of standardized testing that we do use for very severe mental health conditions. But for patients coming in for the first time, we do it, an extensive interview on the issue that they're presenting with. So when a person has a mental health concern, they don't usually come sometimes on their own. A lot of the times family members are pushing them to come because they're worried about changes in their behavior, changes in their performance, changes in their work identity. So they're usually coming in because somebody's telling them that they need to get help. Or on the other hand, some people feel like they're not feeling as well or as happy as they used to, or they're feeling like things are changing, or they're feeling like very confused and unhappy about yeah. something. So when they present to us, these are the kinds of, uh, this is how they present. They're not feeling well, they're not feeling happy about things. And we start use this as a starting point and work our way back until we find out at the beginning when they did feel well, what was that like? And now when they're feeling unhappy, what is that like? And then we make a differentiation and we assess whether or not it, that is abnormal present, presentation or whether it is a normal presentation. So in order to determine if something is doing well or not well because sometimes people say no i'm just feeling sad but like you know i'm, I'm but like what does that mean I, i'm allowed yes. to feel sad i'm allowed to feel worried about something i'm allowed to feel very happy about something that doesn't, doesn't mean there's something wrong with me and that's absolutely true but a professional person or a clinical psychologist like myself will be able to tell you whether or not that is affecting your social functioning and your occupational functioning so this is the main criteria that we use to determine whether or not something is something is good for you or bad for you. So a very sad mood is something that we all, we all get, you know, yeah. like something can happen in your life at work or at home or with your family or with your relationship and you get very sad. That's mm -hmm. a normal response. But when we, ha when we become excessively sad and it starts affecting how we feel about our relationship with our husband or our wife or with our friends, when we feel like we're not worth anything or we feel like why put in more effort into my relationship, like what's the point? Mm -hmm. Then with that more maladaptive and it becomes something more severe and we need to treat it accordingly with therapy and then if it's more severe and warranted then we prescribe medication for that. The same thing with other, with like work, occupational kind of functioning. Occupational functioning is when you can't meet your demands at work or when you can't fulfill your responsibilities at home, like looking after your kids or making sure your house is run well or fulfilling your household obligations and duties. Then we would say that, okay, you're not meeting your requirements and if you're not meeting it because you're feeling really worried all the time about something that you have to do and it's preventing you from actually doing it, then we would say, okay, there's a problem with that and we would assess the, the level of, at which it's a problem and then treat accordingly either with therapy or medication and, but most of the time it's both a combination of therapy and medication. So it's basically the sad feeling that lingers on and you just can't get out of it and mm -hmm. keeps you in a low and depressed mood. Yes. So mm -hmm. Hamida, um, I'm actually very excited today that the topic for discussion is self-care and we know that self-care is of utmost importance and uh, we'd like to talk about self-care for the Muslim woman or yes. just woman in general. Now. 
coming back to what you've just spoken about, about feeling um, low and feeling depressed and feeling sad, is it not that maybe we're not taking enough self-care and mm -hmm. allowing us to fall into mm -hmm. that uh, depressive uh, state? I think that's a very good. I think that's a very good point. So what what usually happens is, so we have mood disorders and we have anxiety disorders. So that's excessive worrying. Anxiety disorders like excessive worrying, excessive concern, and think uh, lots of ruminating and worrying about things that you that are basically out of our control. That we're not really, we don't really know what's going to happen, and we worry about not knowing what's happening. So and then we have mood disorders like depression and bipolar mood disorder. And, and there's a lot of there's different ranges and different kinds of mood disorders and anxiety disorders that we do have when we are talking about self-care we're not talking about treating those disorders so we have to be very aware that if you've been diagnosed with depression or you've been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder self-care is not going to treat that because those are real like tangible illnesses that need professional help in order to treat it but we can use self-care to help prevent our sadness from becoming a depressive, depressive disorder or prevent our worrying about something from becoming an anxiety disorder. I think it's very important for all of the viewers out there to remember that like, if you're feeling like you're depressed or if your doctor tells you that you, know, you have a clinical depression or if you're seeing a psychologist and they say you, know, you, you, have, uh, you have a general anxiety mm. disorder, no amount of self-care is going to make that go away because those are clinical symptoms with clinical presentations and so they need professional help in order to treat that. But if you're feeling down or low, or you're feeling not like your usual self, then we can use self-care in order to help lift us out of that feeling so that we don't become more depressed. So if we think about it as levels, right? Like we have a normal level of functioning here, and then if we, if we go a little bit under, then we can use self-care to bring us back up to our normal functioning. But if we're right at the bottom, then we need proper mental health, uh, mental health work and intervention in order to bring us back up. Okay, so um, Kamira, when we speak about self-care, there's such a broad spectrum, I mean, the word self-care. Maybe you can give us some tips on, or explain to us better, what is self-care? Okay, so self-care is a deliberate attempt to invest in your emotional life, your psychological life, or your physical life in order to better take care of yourself. So when we have a lot of stress, stress is actually... What stress is defined as is the ability to meet your demands with, enough, with not enough resources. When you're lacking resources in order to, to meet the demands of your expectations or the, your environment, then you have stress because you feel like, I have so many things to do, but I don't have enough time to do it, enough money to do it, enough help to do it. And then you get stressed, right? Self-care is a way for you to take time out, to reflect, introspect, look, look after yourself first, so that you can take care of others. And the thing is, there's a difference between, a lot of my patients will tell me, but that's just called, that's just being selfish, you know? <laughs> like if, if self-care is just a way of saying you're being selfish, because like my kids need me now, you want me to take like half an hour away from them, that's just selfish, who's gonna look after them? But it's not selfish, it's self-preservation. So when I say self-preservation, I mean is you can't take care of somebody else if you're not being taken care of. If you, like on the aeroplane, you know, I use this analogy a lot in my practice. I, if you are on an aeroplane and the aeroplane is about to crash, the first thing they tell you is put your own oxygen mask on yeah. first and then put it on to the other people so that you can help more people that way. But if you want to, if you think self-care, self-care is putting the oxygen mask on your face first to make sure that you don't pass out and then you help other people. But a lot of the time people think, no, I don't want to seem selfish, so I'll help the person next to me. But by the time you help the person next to you, you're going to be unconscious. Mm. So we have to look after ourselves first. We have to fill ourselves up with what we need to be filled up on in order for us to help other people. And that's what I would call self-care. So we know that uh, you know, women are a typical example of uh, always prioritizing everyone mm -hmm. else before prioritizing herself because we have quite a full plate. Mm -hmm. I think back in the day, many women, their jobs were just being at home, mm -hmm. uh, raising your kids, yes. uh, looking out for your, mm -hmm. for your spouse and just running your household. But we know that in, in today's times, uh, that in itself was a job back then. And now we have most of our women that are very career driven or the working mom. Mm -hmm. How do you factor in time for self-care? Because it's such a rat race. Mm -hmm. how, how would a woman actually do this? Because mm -hmm. it's your home, it's your job. Mm -hmm. And of course, as a mother and a wife, you want to be able to 
to be there for your kids and for your spouse. So how would you do that? I completely understand where you're coming from because I'm also a working mom and wife and I also I have three kids so I know it's very difficult to make sure that you have enough time for yourself, for your work, for your kids, for your family. It's it's a mission. But this is why we need we need support, right? And we need to so the way is the first and most important thing is time management. We, there is sometimes there's not enough time in the day, but self care doesn't have to be every day. It has to be when you feel when you know yourself, when you know yourself, and you take the time to know what your triggers are, or you take the time to know that okay, I'm not feeling too good. I need to make the time. Same way we can factor in time to drop off our kids, factor in time to do groceries, factor in time to do shopping or to get, uh, to, get to do plan an event that we have for our in-laws or for our family coming over or for, to wait up for Seri for in Ramadan. Yes. Things, life it moves on and things happen all the time. There's always an event, there's always something that we have to do. But if we have to take, if we can make time for all of those things, then you can certainly make time for yourself. Hamida, we're going to take a quick ad break and when back, maybe our viewers can take notes down on how we can create that time for ourselves. So sure. when back from the ad, we'll be chatting more to Hamida Basa. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to Madin and Madis with myself and Hamida Basa Suleiman, a clinical psychologist. So Hamida, before uh, we took our ad break, we were speaking about how we could take time out mm -hmm. for ourselves uh, to self-preserve ourselves. Maybe you could share some tips on how we go about doing it. Okay. Um, so one of the, so I like to break up self-care into like different kinds of self-care, right? So the first and most important one is taking care of your physical self, so taking care of your body. And that's making time for a little bit of exercise, for eating healthily, and for making time that you're uh, making sure that you, you do make time to eat. Because there's so many women who are busy rushing from this point to that point that they forget to eat or they even forget to use the bathroom sometimes. You know, you hold, the whole day you're on taking care of other people, you don't even take care of the little basic necessities that you have to. And that's and so the first thing I would say is making time for yourself to do a little bit of exercise every day or maybe once a week or twice a week whatever you're comfortable with even if that means waking up a little bit earlier for five minutes just to like you know do watch a youtube video and do a five minute exercise workout or something like that yes that's one way of taking care of our physical self the other way is taking making sure that you have enough sleep you know so like if you have very young children and they're waking up at night and then the next day you have a lot of responsibilities what you need to do is you need to be you need to check in with yourself and be like okay i haven't slept at all i, ha I know i have a lot of things done uh, to do let me see what i can cancel or let me see who can help me out with the tasks that i need to do so that i can get some sleep a good night of sleep can make a huge difference to our mood our cognitive capacity and how we think about things so it's very important that we take care of make and make sure that we have enough time to sleep and we have enough time to take care of our physical self Eating is another very important thing that you need to do. Usually if you're, very if you're very rushed and you're doing a lot of different things, then you eat the first thing that you see. Yeah. Usually, and the most easiest things to eat are very sugary, very processed mm. foods, food that you can just get through a drive-thru. Just for that quick energy. Yeah. Just for the quick energy, just for the quick boost. But if you take the day before, just to, or a day sometime in the week to plan your menu or to do some meal prep, can make a huge difference to you or even if you get your uh, if you get somebody to help you to cut up fruits and vegetables and keep them in the fridge in the little the plop bags you can just grab them on the go and then eat them in the car and they can be quite healthy and nutritious and easy for you to consume but also healthy as well so that you're not putting on a lot of weight or you're not losing a lot of weight because you're not eating so taking care of your physical self making the time and making sure that you're looking after your basic functioning can make can go a long way in making sure that you have enough energy to deal with your things doing your regular mental checkups or your health checkups going to your gp to check your blood sugar levels or your cholesterol or your thyroid or your iron a lot of the time we have we feel very low and we think it's because of x y and z but usually it's just because we don't have enough iron and we just need a supplement to make us feel good if we have a medical condition it can very easily mask like a, it can feel like we have a depressive disorder but actually it's just something simple that needs and to be sorted out. And I guess with out. women as well, um, your hormones play an impact on your mood yes. swings, on your energy levels. So if you're not going to be uh, taking that time out 
mm. uh, looking after your state of mind, state of health, um, it's not going to be very easy for you to cope with that on a month-to-month -month exactly, basis. Exactly. So on a month-to-month -month basis, a woman go through these cycles. And mm. so if you, we notice that some, if you take the time to notice, okay, something's not going on, get a medical checkup done. Go see your gynecologist. Make sure your hormones are right. Check in with yourself to make sure everything is okay. What, because if we have, if we take care of our physical self, at least we know we have enough energy and we have enough of we have enough of ourselves to give to other people. If we don't have enough for ourselves, how will we be able to see to our parents, to our children, to our husbands, to our work, to the, the multiple responsibilities that we have? So Hamida, we we um, I can't agree more. It starts out with taking time out to do some physical activity. It also mm -hmm. helps to. Um, re-energize you, mm -hmm. or get those yes. happy hormones yes. out, yes. and your diet. What about um, your emotional well-being? Okay. I, I know that diet will play a huge mm. part in that, because if you're not eating correctly, it would also make you feel mm. low. But what about those women that tend to go on this roller coaster of emotional, uh, you know, where their emotions are down, and they, they're usually okay. emotional all the time? So the second part of self-care is emotional self-care. And this is like some, this is allowing yourself to feel the emotions that you are feeling, right? So a lot of the time what will happen is, if you're feeling sad, you feel like, you say, no, I don't have time to feel sad, I need to move on. Or if you have something that's niggling at you, you know, maybe a conversation didn't go very well with a friend, or maybe you're really worried about how your son did at school and it's really playing on your mind, but you just, you just negate, you just kind of like shove it aside and be like, no, I don't have time for this. Emotional self-care is taking care of your emotions. So being able to identify what your emotion is. Okay, so that's the second part. That's a very good point because what we want, I would like to talk about now is emotional self-care. So emotional self-care is taking care of your emotions and taking care of what you're feeling when you're feeling it. So a lot of the time we feel like we don't have time to be sad or if you're worried about a conversation with a friend and you're thinking about them or you think it didn't go the same way or maybe she was too sensitive or she didn't know how, what you were meaning when you were trying to speak to her. It will play on our mind and then we suddenly decide, no, I don't have time for this, I have to move on. Mm. But those emotions don't just disappear. They stay in with us and they get, they start mm. building and they start festering. And that's when a lot of the time you feel low but you don't know why. And that's because we have a lot of unprocessed emotions inside of ourselves that we don't know what, that, that's just lingering. So a lot of the time if you're feeling something and you don't know what it is, if you take a minute, or two or three minutes, or if you've been for therapy, it will happen instantaneously. If you can label your emotions and, and appreciate what each emotion is and why maybe you're feeling that way, it can make you feel very, very good about yourself and it can make you feel a lot more calmer and content. Because in our minds, there's a lot of things going on. We're constantly processing things and we're constantly looking for things. But, so when we have something that's unresolved, your mind kind of stays fixated on it until it's resolved. So it's a neurochemical, a neuroscientific way of how the brain works. So it's very important for us if we have an emotion to feel that emotion, to understand it, process it and then let it go. Because it's only after we've gone through the emotion that we can let it go. So emotional self-care is allowing yourself to feel the sadness, the worry, to feel the anger, to feel the, the maybe the neglect that you're feeling or to feel that you're not, like you're not special. Allowing that feeling to happen Finding out where it comes from, maybe talking, if you know what you're talk, feeling, it's easier to talk about so it. So I think the key is yeah. to try and identify what's making you feel those emotions in order to well, get it's to more deal to with feel, it. To, to feel what it is and then to label what it is. So then if you know what you're feeling, it's much easier for you to talk then about it, it. Then, and deal with it. Then if you say, no, I don't know what's going on. But the only person who will be able to know what's going on is yourself. So if you take some time to figure out what it is and then how it got there, then we can let it, we can go through it and then let it go. So Hamida, with, uh, we spoke about these emotions that make us feel very anxious. Maybe we can, we can explain to us better what is anxiety? What type of symptoms would one present with to identify if you are actually feeling anxious? Okay, so anxiety for a lot of people, and this is men and women combined, right? Anxiety is a constant fear of something that is not yet happening or something that you fear is going to happen. So in our minds, our minds can't tell the difference between what's real and what's not real. Okay. So it, when we think about something, when we think about a situation, automatically your mind kind of processes it as real and then it let goes of a whole lot of series of emotions and hormones 
in order for you to react to this hypothetical or imaginary situation, right? It's a, it's a mechanism that we have that allows us to feel empathy for lots of people or when we're watching a movie or listening to something, we feel emotional about it. That's because we feel like we're there, but we know we're not there. But what happens with anxiety though, is we constantly worried about what hasn't happened yet and we deal, with, we respond to it as if it's already happening. So for example, if an anxiety disorder or generalized anxiety, there's different kinds of anxiety disorders that you get, but in this kind of scenario, a generalized anxiety would be constantly worrying about something that hasn't happened or constantly worrying that something is going to happen. So for example, if you wake up late and you miss, you're not in the normal routine and you're on a rush now, so you think, okay, I woke up late, so now we're gonna miss breakfast, now I'm not gonna be able to make lunch, and the kids are not gonna have lunch at school, then I'm not gonna be able to come home and do my cooking, and then I'm gonna get late for my dessert, and then I'm gonna be late for supper. So it's pretty much an overactive mind when you're overthinking certain situations? Yes. So you're overthinking, you're, you're overthinking, and then you kind of create catastrophic kind of scenarios in your head. So things that we, remember we were talking about earlier where we, and stress is not having enough resources to deal with the expectations of around us. So anxiety is creating massive expectations that are not really there and then feeling overwhelmed because you don't have the resources to deal with those massive expectations. So a lot of the time when we feel, when we think about all of the things we have to do, we think about it like we have to do it right now. Everything has to be done right now. But if you think, if you process things and you think about it, in a calm way, or if a, a non-anxious person will tell you, but you have to do this at this time, then you have to do this at that time, and then the third thing at that time. So everything has its time. But when you're very anxious, you feel like everything has to happen immediately, or it's not happening in good time. And that creates a lot of thoughts. And when we get fixated on our thoughts, then it leads us to not acting. And more, not acting creates further anxiety. It's kind of like you're stuck in a cycle. cycle. Yes. Yeah. So Hamida, can uh, an individual that's always very anxious, you know, tends to deal with anxiety on a day-to-day -day basis. Can anxiety eventually lead to depression? Definitely. I think, so they're two different, they two different uh, clinical disorders and they two have very different presentations. But a lot of the time you find people with a depressive disorder, they do have some anxiety and some people who have anxiety have a depressive disorder. So all the humans are very complex kind of creatures, right? And we, we don't fit into neat little boxes mm. uh, like I have this and you have that. So a lot of the time it's mixed and it's very, it takes time to figure out what what kind of, what is actually going on and then the treatment method that we have to follow for doing that. There's different and very specific treatments for both. But a lot of patients do go on both and a lot of them are quite happy afterwards. But it does go back to the thing, it does go back to being able to know exactly what's going on, being able to take care of your emotions and being able to say what you feel. Because when we can say what we feel, then we know how to deal with it. Okay, Hamida, so how would one know uh, when you are leading into anxiety? What are, what are some of the triggers, firstly, and how do you know that you are an individual that's always anxious? Okay, so I think if, to, how you would know if you were somebody that's very anxious is if maybe a lot of the time people tell you, you know, you need to calm down, like, if, why are you stressing over this? Like, it's something simple, it will get done. If you're constantly hearing that kind of talk, or if you're constantly feeling very flustered and very panicky about the simple things, you know, like, like simple day-to-day -day things, like routine things that you have to do every day, or you, sometimes you feel so const caught up in the thinking that you have going on about all of the things that you have to do, or how something went, or you're thinking about something that happened in the past and you're ruminating and becoming worried about that then you would, you would kind of, you should need to have an indication that that's not really right. You could also check in with people around you to see if they have similar kinds of feelings. Although a lot of people feel like they're not that brave enough to do that. But if you feel like you do have anxiety and maybe you don't want to talk about it, you can come and see a psychologist and then you can work through it and, and diagnose and see if you do have an anxiety disorder or maybe it's just a normal worry that lots of people have. But I think a major, a major thing is to come, is Think about whether or not your constant worrying and the thoughts that are in your head, if it prevents you from actually fulfilling a task in a way that you would normally be able to do it. Is it making you less productive and less good at what you're able to do? Or is the thinking about the thing and feeling very worried about it 
consuming you so much that you're not actually able to enjoy what you're supposed to do. You know, so if you have like a function. So basically, home, every every aspect becomes a stressful one. Yes, exactly. So for example, if you have um, an event that you're planning at home, like maybe calling some people over for supper, but now planning the menu stresses you out, and you're thinking, oh, I can't do this because so many people are coming, and I don't know, know if I have everything, and how is it going to go? And then then you stress about getting the stuff and then bringing it home and then preparing it, and then when after you in the moment you're constantly worried is it going well is it not, not is it is everybody happy am i doing the right thing yeah. how do i look how does the food look oh no they, this person looked at me funny so i think it's not going well if you if you look having something and you're not able to fully appreciate it because you're worried about how it's going and you then it kind of takes the joy out of doing it in the sure. first place then that would be a very strong indicator that maybe there's a lot of anxiety going on that's not normal and maybe you should help get it. And we'll take a quick ad break and when back we'll be chatting more to Hamida Basasa. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Madan and Madrasa. And our topic for today is self-care of the Muslim woman. With me today we have Hamida Basasa Suleiman. So, Hamida, we, we chatted a fair amount about um, anxiety, and uh, I'd like to know more about depression, you know, but before we get there, we, we spoke about how um, women have now very much branched up into being entrepreneurs and being the working mum. So we have a full plate at home and now you get to work and you have deadlines and you have certain expectations that people have of you. And I find that um, it's just part of our nature as women where if we have a deadline we have to meet it or if someone has an expectation of us we would compromise ourselves in order to, to meet that expectation. How does this affect your psychological well-being as a woman? Um, do you find that when you've got to go through that day, you get home irritable or you tend to vent it off on, mm -hmm. on people that are the closest to you? Okay. So I think that's, I think we, women do take on a lot, right? So we, you take on a lot at home, you take on with the kids, with your husband, and now there's an added one of having to take on stuff at work as well. And I think we have to have very good boundaries about work life and home life. And being, you have to be able to manage your work stresses and your home stresses and make sure that you, you leave the home stuff at home and the work stuff at work. Often that's not really possible because like you know if sometimes you're at work and your kid is sick in school you have to leave work and you have to, you have to go and fetch that child from school, right? So it's not always easy to be able to keep the distinction. But in terms, when I talk about boundaries, I talk about being able to say no sometimes because you know that you have a lot of stuff, a lot of other things that you have to do. So as a working mother, for example, if, if you're working in like a corporate field and it's a day's work and then there's social obligations that you have to do in the evening and then you have to worry, okay, I can't go for this, but, but it's a networking issue but I, and I have kids at home, so how, how do I manage that? And if you, if you put yourself in that kind of situation, it can become very, very overwhelming because a lot of women will feel like, you know, I, I'm, I'm giving half of myself in both places and no place has me completely. So what I tend to advise a lot of my patients is give yourself completely sometimes to each place. Okay, so we, we, instead of spreading yourself thin across, every, across all of the facets and multiple roles that you have, spread yourself enough so sometimes. So, for example, if you have a very like important stuff happening at work, and you your your duties at home will always be there, right? But if you have to give yourself 110 percent at work for this week specifically, I think it's important to be able to tell people at home, or tell your kids, tell your husband, tell your helpers, the people that look after you. Look, I have a lot of responsibilities at work this week for X, Y, and Z. I need everyone to pull through. You know, like mommy's not going to be able to fetch you at school. I'm sorting this out. I'm getting this done. I'm making sure this person cooks the supper. So it's not mommy cooking because I have this to do. So would you say it all comes back to prioritizing and communication? Prioritizing, communication, and good time management. You know, we we have to be very good at organizing our lives and getting and getting help to organize those facets of our lives so that we can we can do everything that we need to do. And the truth is, we can't do everything by ourselves all the time, you know. But do you find that uh, with women it itself, I know with with our Muslim community, when you when you're a Muslim woman, we know that our priorities, our spouse and our children, yes. we've got to put them first. That's Primary, just a part yes. of us, you yes. know. And then you've now become this working mum. 
do you, do you find that more and more women are going through a guilt phase in mm -hmm. their lives because now they feel that they're having to share this time that they were supposed to have mm -hmm. spent with their kids or their spouse, but now mm -hmm. they have to go out working. Do you find that people are having to deal now with something further, dealing with that guilt? Mm -hmm. And does that guilt actually lead to depression? That's okay. So the first thing is, I think all yes. mothers have guilt, whether they're staying at home or whether they're working or whether they half uh, they, they see their, pet, their kids only on weekdays or weekends. All mothers have guilt. You know, that's just like that's just like ingrained in us. If we are at home with our kids all day, did I give them enough attention? Was I too irritable with them? Was I not like? Was, did I cook enough? Did I give them the right food? Or was I too tired for them? If we're working, do we did I spend enough time with them because I was busy at work the whole day? I don't know what happened in his day today because he was too tired to tell me, and I came home too late. I think all mothers have guilt, regardless of what the situation is. We all carry the guilt with us. But we have to be able to, again, manage that guilt. And I think like educating yourself on why you're doing something and for what reason can, be, can go a long way in helping to like, soothe that guilt. So if you're at home and you have to go to work because you know, of the economic times, sometimes you need dual incomes in order to run households now and to send your kids to good schools and all of that. Or maybe you just like to work because it makes you feel fulfilled as a person and it's a, your way of taking care of yourself. For what is the reason that you have to leave the house to start up, maybe you have a business because that's your passion and that's what you've always wanted to do, right? Regardless of why you're not at home, I think it's, it, you have to know why you're doing it and what's the purpose of that and then educate the people around you so that they know as well so that instead of it becoming my work and my time here it becomes a family kind of a goal together you know kids go to school parents go to work and that's just something that we all do sometimes school is very stressful and we have to put all of our dialect energy in that Sometimes mom's work needs all of her energy. Sometimes dad's work needs all of his energy. You know, dad's got a big meeting. We all have to make sure that he has enough time to prepare for it. We have to be on board. So, like, family units are teams, and we need to work together in order to keep the team going. And I think we all have, we have guilt, but we have to manage that guilt by making sure that we're doing things for the right reasons. Islamically, yes, the woman's main goal is to take care of her children and to take care of her house and her family. So that's why our main focus has to be there. But once that's done and once you have, once you're making sure that they're taken care of, then and you, it can also be very valuing for them to know that, you know, mom has, mom has all of these things and maybe when I grow up, I want to do that too. So if we have good family goals and we educate each other on what these goals are, then instead of seeing it as mine and yours and this and that, mm. it can become an hour. Like so it's hour more thing. creating that support structure in order for each to, other to within the family as well, so that your kids understand as well that it's not going to be like this all the time. You know, mom was here with me now, but now she's got this business, and now she's always there, and she doesn't care, yeah. care about me anymore. No, mom's got the business, but that's important for there. And when we have time together, that will be our time together. So we have to we have to educate our children and we have to educate society as well to know that because there's a lot of working women now, the, the, the goals and the values need to change, you know, the ideas of like the best kind of the, or the most homeless family needs to change. But what we can't let go of is making time for family. Like we cannot all become career focused and spending late nights at work and not having enough time for family. I think you just need to balance, have a good balance have a and good have work the ideal balance. Uh, time yes. management. But what about depression? Do you find that this, for those that uh, feel this type of guilt, can guilt lead you into depression? Definitely. If you have a lot of guilt and you, that you don't feel or allow yourself to feel and allow yourself to manage and accept, okay, I feel guilty about this, but it's okay because I'm doing it for, for these reasons, then the guilt starts to fester. Any emotion that you don't address directly starts to fester. And then we start thinking about those thoughts because anything that's left undone circulates in your mind and, it, and it doesn't you can't let go of it so if, so if you don't process it enough it does fester and then you can become at risk for depression or any other kind of mental health issues so basically if you're not going to be dealing with it you tend to become your your own worst enemy because yes. you which is why self-care is so important self -care. all right but how would an individual know that you're now slipping into depression what are the signs and 
symptoms of depression. So it, the first, the most important thing, I think, that the, so lots of people can look like they're not depressed, you know. They can be well dressed, they can uh, look like, and they can be going to work and meeting the responsibilities at home, but, but they are depressed. Mm -hmm. So depression affects different parts of people in different ways. It can be very apparent or it can be something that's happening on insidely on the inside. So if you, so one of the symptoms are, is like a complete feeling of helplessness. Like you feel like nobody can help you or there's no way out of the situation that you're in. So that's the, and it's a constant feeling, even if it's not really representative of the truth, or if it's not real, it's still a feeling that's there that doesn't go away. So if it lasts for more than two weeks or three weeks, it doesn't go away, then that usually means that you have some sort of clinical depression. Another kind, another symptom is feeling very, feeling very low, feeling very tearful, feeling very sad a lot of the time without any specific reason. Or if you know what the reason is, feeling like there's no, there's no one that can help you and there's no hope for you. Like feeling like all the hope is gone is a very, very strong indicator that there's depression. Also losing interest in things that you usually like to do, like for example cooking, or like maybe you like cooking or going out or going to the beach or having fun with your friends, but now you don't want to do any of that anymore. That can also be a very strong indicator that there is depression. Um, in more severe forms of depression, it's like there's like being sleeping a lot of the time, not being able to get out of bed, feeling like it requires too much of energy to do your, your daily tasks, like for example brushing your teeth, combing your hair, having a bath, those are very severe forms of depression where patients feel like it's just too much of energy to be able to do these simple things. And when it gets to that stage, then there's, you have to get like you have to have, get professional help because it's only with therapy and medication that you can lift yourself. So up. coming back to to women, um, I think it's rather important for women to to look out for those uh, mm. tell signs of depression because if a woman had mm. to be placed in that situation where you don't want to get out of bed and it's too much of an effort um, to perhaps brush your teeth or get mm -hmm. showered. How then does the rest of your household run? If you're not what you ideally should, then surely that affects your kids and it affects your spouse. It does, it does, which is why self-care is so important because we need to fill ourselves with enough energy in order to deal and in order to give back to the people around us, right? So I think mental health, if it affects somebody, it doesn't just affect you, it affects the people around you as well. Which is why, if we come back to earlier, it's important to, to have people that you're close to that, that are in tune with what you're doing and, in, and are aware of what you're feeling. Because again, if you do happen to get depression, it's not the end of the world, right? You, there is treatment and there is help out there. And the people around you should be able to acknowledge like, okay, look, mom's not feeling too well. She's been like this for a while. You know, your kids would be able to pick up on that. Your husband should, your in-laws, the people staying around you, grandparents, parents, they should pick up on that. And they should be able to ha try and help support you so that you can get strong. A lot of the time, we, as women, we want to give, right? We're giving and giving and giving. But we also need to be able to receive as well. We were talking about family units before, right? Like, mom, yes, my mom is there to do everything and organize. Yes, she has this work. But you have your kids and your family too. They're also there for you to rely on and for them to be there in, in a time of need for you so that they can take care of you as well. And if you have family goals and we're in tune with each other as a family, then we can help each other through whatever kind of like negativity that you're going through, whatever rock bottoms you have, whatever kind of sad situation you have. Pick each other up. Pick each other up and support each other. And if you do have depression, yes, it is going to affect your family, but your family should be able to help you as well. And you, in doing that, you help yourself because you want to be there for them okay. too. We'll take a quick ad break and when back, we'll be chatting more to Hamida Basa Suleiman. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Modern and Modest. And our topic of discussion today is self care for the Muslim woman. So, Hamida, we chatted a fair amount about anxiety and depression, and it all just stems down to self care. And I'd like us to just reiterate about what we discussed at the outset on why self-care is so important, what we should do, the steps we need to do uh, to avoid us leading into depression and so forth. Okay, but I think uh, I think we have to take care of like ourselves firstly, so like our physical self-care, our emotional self-care, uh, like making sure that we're feeling all of our emotions and then being able to say no sometimes and not p putting a lot of responsibility on ourselves. 
So a lot of the time, the people usually ask you, you say yes, because you don't want to feel like you're too busy or you want to be polite or you don't want to let somebody mm -hmm. down. But a big part of self-care is being able to say no, because that's what is important to you. So if, for example, you know, somebody says they're having a birthday party and then you offer to take something and then, and then you or don't offer to just buy it and take it, but then you want to make it and take it and then you, have, you still have to go to work that day. I think it's important to get your priorities in order and to know that sometimes if you say no, it's okay because you're taking care of yourself and oh, you're I trying to do what's best for you. sometimes if you've got to go and walk into a bakery and buy something, it's, it's also okay. okay. <laughs> it's also okay. Or supporting okay. your home industries around you, you know, getting helping those people who do that for a living can be actually better for you and for them, you know. So I think taking the easy way out sometimes is not a bad thing because it's a good way of taking care of yourself and not making yourself overwhelmed so that you don't get things like depression or anxiety because you, you're doing things that make you do things well. And then you're also able to enjoy whatever it is that you have to do with you. You know, you're enjoy, able to enjoy your time with your kids, your time with your family, and you're able to really fully appreciate that moment that, that, is, that is so special. Um, so I think if we are, in terms of self-care, we need to be more mindful. And we need to live more in the present moment rather than worrying about what we have to do later or what we have to do in the future. Just being present and just enjoying the moment and knowing that whatever we have to do will happen in due time. I think also for the like a lot of our Islamic viewers out there, having a good connection with Allah really is, can be the best form of self-care for yourself. So knowing and completely submitting to His will and knowing that He is the person that ultimately loves us and takes care of us can go a huge way into making you feel like you're not alone and that the burden that you're carrying is not for your own and it's not for nothing. You know, Allah says in the Quran that He doesn't give us a burden, you don't have the strength to bear. So knowing that this specific issue that you have or this specific problem that you have is something that Allah has given you can make you feel a little bit lighter and better. If you have a connection with Him, knowing that, okay, it's fine, Allah's given me this, He knows I can sort it out, I probably can. If I couldn't, I wouldn't be here. I suppose no. also when you when you want to do things for your family or you want to do things for friends, please an individual, it might be very stressful. But maybe change that intention and, and tell yourself you're doing it to please your creator. Exactly. And maybe there'd be more joy and reward out of uh, But also, like, if you're doing it to please Allah, then he knows how much of effort you put into it, how much of thought it was, how, how difficult it was for you to do this in addition to everything else that you have yes. to do. So I think like developing a connection with Allah and making sure that you, you're always talking to Him. So even if you're really busy and you only have time to read your father's namaz, right? Because it's a really busy mm -hmm. day. But in between that, you make zikr and you're talking and you're saying, Zakla, I was able to, to, to remember to take out the chicken from the freezer last night, so I was able to cook my food on time. You know, okay. like shukar alhamdulillah for that. But but if you may, if you're constantly talking to him, it's a form of zikr and bada as well, because you're constantly remembering him. And if you always have somebody near you there, you don't feel so alone and doesn't feel so difficult, because then you feel like you know you're not doing it for a person, you're doing it for him. It's adding to your sawabs for the akhirat. And it can make everything that you're going feel a lot more lighter and a lot more pleasant. So I think having a good like connection with Allah is actually very beneficial for you. And research also says that people who have who are more religious and have good faith actually have better psychological health than people who don't. And that's because if you depend on yourself for everything, it's too much. You have to have you have to have something bigger than you that's out there that you can depend on. So I think being able to say no sometimes, having a good connection for Allah, making time for yourself, spending time doing things uh, that make you feel happy, all of those things can, go, can do a lot to bring you back to your optimal so that you don't get serious mental health conditions. Yeah, and I think um, maybe you can just explain to our viewers more about how to feel, uh, not to feel guilty mm -hmm. uh, in many situations. You know, like you mentioned earlier, as women we tend to feel that we're being selfish but I like what you've mentioned, it's not being selfish, it's self-preservation. So maybe we can just touch a little bit on that. Okay, I think, so a lot of the time I use this analogy of, a, of a, like a jug, right? like this jug of water mm -hmm. that we have here. If, if, you are, if you imagine yourself as like a jug of water, right? and every day you're pouring water out to everyone, you pour some in the morning to your kids, you pour some to your husband, you pour some for your, to the things that you have to do at home, and then you go to work and you pour some more, you're constantly pouring out of a jug of water. Eventually the water, the water finishes and there's nothing left to pour. And then you deplete it and there's nothing left. When, when we at that point, there's, there's nothing left for us to give. And we're at high risk 
for developing depression, anxiety, and PTSD, and a lot of other mental health conditions, right? So we need to be able to fill our jugs with water. And each person out there should think about what makes them feel fulfilled, you know? What makes you feel fulfilled with a jug of water? When you, when you read a book in the night, just before you go to bed, when you take 10 minutes extra to just enjoy a cup of coffee or tea, or if you, if you take an afternoon off and you say, you tell your husband, please can you take care of the kids for this time because I'm going out with my friends, or you get your in-laws or your mother to help you with your children for the drop-offs and pick-ups so you can just be at home. What fulfills you? What makes you feel loved and pampered and taken care of? Is it a spa day? Is it going for madrasa classes? Is it learning Arabic? What, what makes you feel fulfilled? What fills your jug up? And I think if we can learn, if we, our guilt can get kind of addressed if we know that we've already given to everyone and now it's time to give ourselves. So I mean, how much of time would you say uh, an individual needs to take out daily just for self-care? Daily? Daily. I think daily we should have at least 15 minutes for yourself. Which is not a lot to ask. Which is not a lot to ask for. Okay. 15 to 20 minutes of time for yourself, whether it's while you're reading something, whether it's you doing exercise, whether it's whatever, or you scrolling through your phone, whatever it is, you can take 15 minutes out of your day. I think the best thing for you to do is just to reflect on how much you've accomplished that day, and how much you've been through for that day, and how mu- how far you've come, and how much of like gratitude we should show to like Allah as mm-hmm. well for how much we've got through that day. I think 15 minutes, if you could do that every day, can really make a big change, you know. I mean, there's new research out at the moment that says if you practice gratitude every day for 21 days, it actually changes the wiring in your brain and makes you more mindful and helps you feel better about yourself. And if in that 15 minutes you can start doing that, that can make a huge change for yourself. It can really like, provide good impact on your self-esteem. And because I think if you imagine yourself as always giving and you never receiving, it's not a long-term solution. You're going, you're going to burn out, you're going to get depleted, and you're going to be so exhausted that you're not going to be able to help anybody. It's pretty much a give and take uh, situation. Definitely, reciprocity. The more I give you, you give me. I love you, you love me back. And you have to be able to give and take. Otherwise, there's, you always, you're going to get resentful afterwards. When you always give... When it doesn't become joyful any longer, you just find yourself giving all the time. Exactly. So Hamida, just before we wrap up our show today, what type, what uh, advice can you share with our viewers out there? Okay, so I think the main uh, kind of advice I can share with everyone is, firstly, remember to take care of yourself. And if you're feeling confused about whether or not you are doing a good job or you're feeling like maybe you need a little bit more advice or help for something, I think get in touch with the psychologist some in your area. You, it's very easy to find them on Google. You just si- type in psychologist Durban or whatever it is and get a psychologist to talk to you and find out exactly what it is that's worrying you. Find out if it's more severe, if it needs more, if it needs more intervention or if it's not something so bad. A few strategies can really help. It can also be the part of self-care that you take for yourself for that week and in talking through that hour because it can be very beneficial to have somebody listen to your story from your point of view and give you advice on how to help yourself. And I think it go, there's a lot of stigma about going to see psychologists or psychiatrists or even intervening on your mental health mm. and make addressing maybe that you're worried about what's going on with yourself. And we need to really work hard and to talk more about our issues. Because if you start talking to the people around you, you'll see that you're actually not alone. Everybody goes through similar kinds of things has similar worries, has similar concerns, they're all worried about whether or not their mental health is in order, whether or not they're suffering from some kind of mental illness, whether or not they're crazy. Mm. And if you speak about it, the less stigma there is and the more better you feel about reaching out. Because I think if you don't reach out, then you will never be able to receive help. And if you can't receive help, then how will you be able to help yourself? So I think we, it's important for everyone out there, if they're feeling like they're not doing well or they know somebody that's not doing well, please encourage them to go and see somebody or to talk about it so that they know where they are. Well, I guess, you know, it's it's very much like going to visit a doctor mm. if you're not feeling good. Mm. And your mind and your mental mm, health definitely. is of utmost importance because if, if your mental health isn't stable, mm-hmm. then 
you're going to crumble eventually. No so health no. without mental health. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, Hamina, how could we get in touch with you? How would, can we reach out to you? Okay. So, you, if you want to get in touch, you can go visit my website, which is www.hbs-psychologist.co.za, or you can find me on Facebook or Instagram with at HBS Psychologist. And that's the easiest way to contact me, and you can send an email or a WhatsApp message or direct message me and they were able to contact you immediately with whatever questions you have. Well, okay. it was rather informative and such a pleasure once again having you on our show. Mm -hmm. uh, Shukran for joining us and uh, to all our viewers, I hope you've taken note on all the tips that Hamida has shared with us on self-care. And until next week, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.